Welcome to Free Thoughts. I'm Trevor Burris. And I'm Aaron Powell. Joining us today is Matt Lurosier, a legal associate at the Cato Institute. Welcome to Free Thoughts, Matt. Thanks for having me. Now, why would anyone own a gun? <laughs> Well, I mean, there's a there's several reasons. Uh, one, they look really cool. Uh, that's the most important. But but no, I mean, you can. There's countless reasons people own guns. There, I mean, there are still a small uh, segment of the population that use them uh, for hunting you know, very regularly. Uh, I think that's the, going down, though, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. No, well, and it's, which is good. Uh, you know, as food becomes easier to get, there's less and less people that depend on the ability to like harvest squirrels. But uh, the most important reason uh, from a legal perspective and from a societal perspective is the simple reality that there are instances where people will be subject to illegal force, like attacked or burgled or what have you, and those people ought to have an effective mechanism to defend themselves. They, they shouldn't have to depend on physical strength or, or skill uh, if they haven't done anything wrong. But I think it's interesting that... Uh for you, you have a different kid thing you did not bring up, which is there's also hobbyist. Right. No, and of course there's... I mean, that you, the guns are interesting uh, right. just mechanically, and right. that's another reason. Yeah, no, and, and not only interesting mechanically, like if you're an engineer, you, you, could, you could be fascinated by developments in, in different uh, semi-automatic weapons. Uh, and if you're like me and you have uh, military history in your family... Uh, I am just utterly fascinated by collecting the weapons of the French military and just how different and, and bizarre they can be. And uh, I get a lot of satisfaction from just collecting these stupid guns. But isn't there something, I guess, wrong with getting satisfaction from collecting things designed to inflict horrific harm on others? I mean, you could, you could say like, well, my hobby is collecting pathogens <laughs> um, and I, I just love them and I love looking at them, but we'd say, well, that's that's all cool and all, but you know, those things are dangerous. Well, I think first of all, hobbyists generally are frowned upon by the broader public. Uh, people think that uh, comic book collectors are odd and we make fun of them. Uh, but I mean, I think it's, guns are a particularly divisive subject, but People collect swords, like people will put up medieval swords and have done it for ages and no one ever, no one ever says, now why would you want a sword? That's for lopping off limbs and it's horrifying. Uh, it's just there's something about guns that our societal conscious has more freely associated with their use as a weapon. Whereas uh, there's tons of other things people collect that if you spend too much time harping on it, uh, you can come to odd situations like spiders or or snakes. It's why would you want a horrible snake? You know, it could choke you and it's venomous, but there's all these, we, we don't look at somebody who has a snake collection. I mean, like I said, society, they're a hobbyist, they're considered odd, but we don't say, we don't put that same onus on them that, that you're collecting killing machines. My brother used to collect snakes, so I'm, if some, and I always thought it was very weird, so I have some sympathy for and that. And you probably <laughs> have enough guitar pedals. And I do have <laughs> enough guitar pedals. Yes, collecting is, is interesting, but it is true. Guns are interesting, but I, I'll grant that you, you know, an 1875 French firearm with a really interesting firing mechanism or beautiful carving or something like that is, is interesting by itself, but why would anyone want, want to own an AR-15? Well, and just by the way, Trevor and I have related at length about our collections. Yes. <laughs> about <laughs> guitar the, pedals. The weirdness of collectors, but, but yeah. and you and you have your your gun collection, but yeah. but AR-15s right. seem totally different. Why would anyone want to own an AR-15? AR-15s are fascinating in that, really, if you're interested in weapons design and development like I am, uh, the AR-15 basically terminated uh, weapons developments. Th that was the end. There is there's been no more. At least in the sixty or seventy years since it was first designed, there's been no substantial developments in firearm op operating mechanisms the air 15 is pretty much is pretty much been the end i mean modern even the newest most high tech weapons all trace their roots to the air 15 in terms of locking mechanism and, and how the action works yeah, well, and first of all, the AR-15 is not just a gun, right? It's right. like it's a, it's a pattern. It's a pattern. Yeah. Can you explain more what that means? Okay, so the like the M16A1 is a gun. You can point to it. You can point to it, and that is a particular um, firearm that as it looks one way. The AR-15 is a it's a basic set of principles and standardizations that can apply to all kinds of different weapons. Like we have the AR-15, AR which is the general principle for any 
uh, civilian sporting version of the this same system, the M16, the M4A1, and then there's like weird Danish versions, and and it, and they're all the AR pattern. And so if you, you can build one yourself too, correct? Yeah. And so they're, they're modular to some degree. They're completely modular, and that's the main advantage. But, so what is it about them that ended progress and right. development? Okay, so they're just extremely, it's just a good design. It's sealed off from dirt and dust. Common knowledge says that the AK-47 is the most reliable firearm. Well, actually, tests show that the AR-15 is better sealed against dust and debris. It is just, it is a very simple mechanism to an extent and very repeatable, reliable uh, performance that it's just very dependable is the best way I could say it. It doesn't have a lot of quirks. Yes. But yeah. And, and they, they, you can fire it as quickly as you pull your the trigger, correct? That's semi-automatic. And that can be pretty quick with an AR-15. So to understand, and people get confused between the term semi-automatic and automatic, to understand these terms, we really have to go back to the turn of the century where weapons were typically manually operated. You'd fire a shot, you would manually operate the action. Like and, cock it back. Yeah, yeah. cock it, uh, whatever. Bolt action, whatever. Exactly. Yeah. Or a shotgun pump action. You know, something like that was always required. Then when we came out with uh, semi-automatic firearms, they were typically referred to as self-loaders. But at, over the course of different languages, you know, like the French referred to them as fusil automatique, automatic rifles. And it was because they automatically loaded themselves. You, you weren't having to perform these manual actions. Uh, the British Howell automatic rifle was a mechanism that bolted onto a bolt action rifle and automated the system of cocking it. Then later on with machine guns rising, rising to prevalence, fully automatic fire means that you hold the trigger down one time and the weapon does all of the rest. So there's no resetting of the trigger. There's no additional input aside from the feeding of ammunition. Semi-automatic fire is you pull the trigger and the firearm will do everything it needs to do to fire one shot. So you pull the trigger and then automatically the bolt kicks out this empty case, loads a new round, and then is ready for you to do it again to fire the next shot. Okay, so but you can still fire pretty quickly with an AR-15. Right. I mean, you can't just hold down the trigger right. on a civilian one that you haven't modified yeah. at least. No, and all you have to do is pull the trigger, which is not you know a tremendous feat for most people. Is that what the bump stocks got around? Well, so yeah, the bump stocks are a, a fascinating thing uh, in that it, this is all getting down to really legal, technical interpretations of firearm law. Uh, the National Firearms Act regulates uh, who can possess a machine gun. And a machine gun is defined by any weapon that can fire automatically more than one shot with a single function of the trigger. And so the understanding uh, has been that the trigger's actual physical actuation, so the trigger moving backwards by the press of a finger, is an, a function. And so the bump stock is basically just a very... Uh, I describe it as a very bad gun stock because a gun stock is supposed to keep a gun steady. A bump stock allows a gun to uh, a certain degree of movement back and forth. And so by putting forward pressure, you're actually causing you yourself to pull the trigger and then the recoil. So you, you pull the gun forward, correct? Yes. Essentially, you hold it against your shoulder, pull it with your hand that would be supporting support the, the support hand, yeah. and keep your finger locked on the trigger. Exactly. And then, and then when it fires, you'll it'll recoil. Yeah. And then, and then it will do it again, kind of automatically. Well, it it takes a degree of skill to do, which is kind of the funny thing because the AR-15 has really not much recoil. You can easily overcome it by uh, with your forward pressure and the bump stock won't work at all. So you have to kind of practice with holding it just right and putting just the right amount of forward pressure on it to make it actually bump back and, and cycle. Uh, but all that gets back to the, the issue here is people always say, well, why would you, you know, want something that fires so many shots or why, what is the legitimate need for that? And that's a really complicated issue. And it's because a weapon's efficacy is limited by its recoil, no matter what its rate of fire is. Um, and this is, and people, what people have to understand is that no modern military uses fully automatic machine gun fire in regular soldier, you know, soldier on soldier engagements. They use semi-automatic fire because that is the best way to hit your target. Machine gun fire is used to suppress an area, to keep people from, like, if you wanted to keep people from going down a, a hallway, you would pepper 
machine gun fire down that direction is a, just a deterrent. Aimed fire is the most effective um, mechanism for actually hitting your target. And so, no matter how fast your gun shoots, you need to put it back on target to shoot again. So, it really doesn't matter. This is why magazine capacity doesn't matter that much, because there comes a point where you get diminishing returns. There's, and we've pretty much reached that point now with AR-15s. You, they recoil very little, but it's still enough to disrupt you and you have to put it back on target. You get any less power than that and the round is really not very effective. So it doesn't really make much of a difference. If you have a fully automatic fire, you you're might get more rounds downrange, but your hit rate is going to go down a lot. Uh, you need to, like I said, the main point here is that you need to actually, after every shot, recoil impulse hits the shooter, throws the gun off target, the shooter has to competently put it back on target for the gun to do anything aside from just spraying lead. So a lot of people who are pro-Second Amendment, pro-gun, anti-gun control, get frustrated during debates about gun control, especially the, the kinds of debates that happen just after a shooting, because they say, look, the, the people making these arguments for gun control don't understand all the stuff that you just told us about. They, right. they don't get the difference between semi-automatic and automatic. They don't understand what the bump stocks are doing. They don't understand why people would use one gun over another and so on. They get you know calibers mixed up, whatever. Mm -hmm. Why is that a cogent concern or objection if the issue at hand is everything you've just described is just factors of how effective these things are at doing what they were designed to do, which is put bullets at high speed into people or other things, that it seems like then all we really need to understand to have a debate about gun control is whether we think it's okay that people have devices that are designed to do that. Right. Um, and if we don't, then what mechanisms we can use to prevent them from having those sorts of devices. So why do all the details, the, you know, like you don't know anything about guns arguments matter at all in this discussion? I think it's because in this country, we, most people agree that somebody ought to be able to defend themselves if their life is actually in danger. Uh, I think in other countries, in other countries, that's a, a totally different calculus. There, there are countries where they, um, through legislation or what have you, they've decided that no, 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 we think it's better for society if people do not have the right to use deadly force in self-defense. In America, that's completely different. We've already had that discussion, and we've decided that people should be able to defend themselves if they are subject to unlawful force. So once we've made that decision, it then comes down to when we're moving things along at the margin with gun control, what are we going to do? And the reason these factors are important is because you, the whole point of having a gun for self-defense is that it's an effective mechanism for defending yourself. So if, if the laws are, are being designed, which are, like we said, ignorant of how the weapon actually functions and what the purpose of its design is, it can actually... Well, well, you know, clearly the intention of the bump stock bans or whatever is to prevent a, uh, a, t a catastrophe like uh, what happened in Vegas. The result of these policies can be to actually uh, cripple someone's ability to use a firearm for self-defense. Now, I'm not saying bump stocks are effective for self-defense. Actually, I, I strongly argue that aimed fire is the only effective mechanism for self-defense, really. But when you group in, you know, the high capacity magazines is something I often like to talk about. Uh, you have to imagine a world where it was perfectly implemented where, so like we got rid of all the 30 round magazines, there's only 10 rounders, right? Now, imagine the very real possibility that somebody in a home is attacked uh, by two armed uh, criminals. Does it look completely fair, I mean, to use the term, if you can say that, oh, well, it's all right because they all have 10 rounds. Then well, you, that seems like enough. <laughs> I mean, it, it does. Well, it, it seems that way, doesn't it? But then when you actually- how a uh, shot you are. Well, it, exactly. And there's, a, there's data that says uh, average shooters are, have about a 30 to 40% hit probability at a typical engagement distance, which is you know between uh, 15 and 25 feet. Uh, Expert shooters, quote unquote, and this is defined by uh, 
police science management uh, journal. So I don't know what they consider an expert shooter, but expert shooters only had a 49% hit probability at typical engagement distances. You combine that with the fact that in the grand scheme of things, guns are not that lethal. Individual shots, uh, like from an AR-15, I believe, and I don't know this completely, but uh, one shot from an AR-15 is statistically between 17 and 22% lethal. So you need to land multiple shots on target if you need to stop a threat. Well, do you, I mean, do we really want to just kill them? I mean, we, we are all about non-lethal, you know, right. tasers, rubber yes. bullets, things like this to stop people in many situations. So why don't we just take rubber bullets and put them in our AR-15s? Air, well, or just to modify that question, I mean, if it only has a 20% chance of killing someone, that's not the same thing as it only has a 20% chance of stopping, stopping them. them. Right. No, it's not. It's It's really unfortunate, but in a life or death situations, the only way to actually stop somebody who is hopped up on adrenaline and you know when guns are in the question is to land either a debilitating or lethal shot and 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 you know that's horrible nobody wants to be in that position but we're not making policy for we're not making policy for like you know video games this is for real life where people's lives are actually in danger and there's a clear uh, aggressor and defender we don't want this situation to happen at all but then when you recognize if it is going to happen what do we want the defender to be able to do? So if you take that situation, if you just hash out the math on the back of the envelope, the defender has 10 rounds. The t attackers have 10 each. And also, if you are attacking somebody, if you are doing crime, if you are intending on being violent, you're likely to bring spare magazines. And it only takes a couple seconds to reload. If you are just a person who carries a gun for self-defense or has a gun next to your nightstand, what is the likelihood that you keep uh, a belt of spares on you? Uh, and so that's why that's why it's a very complicated discussion. It's not as simple as saying, oh, 10 rounds is enough. And then also, there, different weapons have different capabilities, and people should be able to choose for themselves whether they want a weapon that has more recoil, more power per shot, or and, then, and holds less rounds, or a weapon that has less recoil, less lethal per shot, but they have more, if they're not as good of a shot, they have more chances to hit their targets. These are all questions that I could never make for another person and that I have, you know, in my experience as a shooter have made for myself. I don't believe that there's any principled policy that can draw that line for everybody. Now, it seems that I read about guns that accept very large capacity magazines and we're not talking about 10 rounds here or even 12 we're talking about 50 or 100 yeah. which those magazines would seem to have little more than novelty use or complete carnage use uh, right. in in a standard setting uh, I don't think many gun owners own a 50 round magazine probably right. not um, but if we're talking about a high capacity magazine what what is a high capacity magazine in that regard so the way I would define it is a weapon is a magazine that actually stretches the capacity of the weapon beyond what it was originally designed for so an AR-15 was originally designed with a 20 round mag but then standardized to 30 I wouldn't call that high capacity. It's standard equipment. However, the Beta C magazine, which is this ridiculous looking contraption like you describe, it really is a novelty, holds 100 rounds. That's certainly a high capacity magazine. It stretches the weapon beyond the limits of its original design. It requires odd external fixtures uh, to function correctly. However, it's still a complicated question. The re there's a reason that the military didn't standardize and that law enforcement didn't standardize on 100-round magazines. You would think that even though reloading is so fast, it would be nice if our soldiers didn't have to worry about it, right? Well, the more rounds you put into a magazine, the more friction is imparted by each round, then it increases the likelihood of a jam. Uh, actually, in the uh, Aurora, Colorado shooting, the shooter employed one of these magazines, and within a few shots, it completely locked the weapon up and actually allowed people to escape. He fumbled with his weapon for quite some time before switching to another weapon. He didn't actually clear the malfunction. So, you, you know, you don't want to, like, you'd never, I would never say uh, it would actually be better off if they had these uh, magazines. But there's a reason people don't use them yeah, in, there's a in reason normal not shooting cir exactly. circumstances. So there's just not enough, I wouldn't say there's enough reason to obsess over it. Uh, because it's just not particularly effective. Well, do I mean most shootings are mass shootings, so right. it would seem that that it you can do most crime with a ten round magazine if that's what you want to do. Yeah, the average number of shots. I think it's um, 
in uh, Gary Kleck's book, he looked over uh, shootings that in w- were mutual shootings with law enforcement officers. And so like this is this is your typical crimes that you'd think would be the biggest shootouts. And the average number of shots fired was like two and a half. Uh, and so the the instances, again, this only matters in the incredibly rare instance where more than 10 rounds is fired. Now, here's another thing where we talk about technology and what people know about guns, silencers. Ah. Now, if I've paid attention to my James Bond movies, <laughs> silencers turn a gun into a dart gun, essentially, or a little like little thing, and, and yeah. they're pretty much illegal. Uh, they're, they're regulated, but they're pretty much illegal, it, which if that's what they do, is probably a good thing. Well, I so I re- resist that. They're not pretty much illegal. They are they fall under the same laws as machine guns do, but individuals are still allowed to make and register suppressors. Just requires the payment of a two hundred dollar tax. So, of all of the things that are incredibly restricted in the NFA, silencers or, or suppressors, whatever you call it, uh, are definitely on the less restricted side. And many many people have them. Uh, but this is just a basic function of physics. It, when something is a full-powered cartridge, it's de- delivering hundreds and hundreds of joules to the target, and that's coming out of the muzzle of a weapon. There is no way to silence the delivery of a thousand joules. You just can't. It also comes out of the side of the gun too. Exactly. Right? It doesn't just all come out of the barrel. Yeah, when it's a semi-automatic, uh, yes, it gas ex- escapes out the side, and and otherwise, people people what people see they see people shooting twenty twos, and even the twenty two. The typical 22 that you just buy at Walmart is supersonic, which means it comes out of the barrel and there's going to be a supersonic crack, which is loud. Uh, people buy reduced power 22 ammo to make their suppressed weapons sound like, you know, like you were like the type thing. And even that, it's still about as loud as shutting a car door. Uh, it, really, the primary uh, efficacy of suppressors would be and has been hearing protection. Uh, they were experimented with in World War II, and it really just didn't make enough of a difference. Where it, you know they, they didn't, and they're cheap to make. So if it was that much of a difference, they would have issued these to everybody, right? It, it would have been, it would have cost almost nothing, but they didn't because it just, it just isn't that effective. It's really not that much of a difference. So even for hearing protection, it's like it, it's a, it's just a few decibels. It's not, it's not even a ton, right? Well, I mean, as you know, when you drop a few decibels, it's actually a, a lot. Uh, but it's it does generally get to the point where I mean we're talking about 110 decibels, which is on the border of what's safe versus 130, which is just like stupid loud. Uh, so it's a it's a good thing to have, and it'll what really people do, uh, and what my friends who use suppressors, I don't I don't really bother with one. I can't be bothered to pay that stupid tax. Um, is they still use hearing protection, but when they are going to shoot a lot of rounds, they put their suppressor on just. To extra, for it's, so it's comfortable, and they can sh- they can shoot without um without getting fatigued. Because over time, if you're shooting a lot of rounds, you get fatigued by the noise. It really does uh, work on you. Anybody who's been to a uh, you know a loud concert and sat in the front, I don't think you feel like a spring chicken when you get out. <laughs> you know, you it it does fatigue you. Now the controversy recently has been. 3D printed guns, and I wanted to make sure you know lay the groundwork on some of these how these guns work and stuff, so we can get into this conversation about homemade right. guns. So, you know, you know guns, you know how they work, you know what the laws are, and now everyone's freaking out about 3D printed guns. At least in this last week here, yeah. um, what? Why? First of all, I guess the first question is what happened to make suddenly everyone freak out about 3D printed guns? Because I think a lot of people have known that they existed, yeah. but but it came into the news all of a sudden. So they've existed since before Cody Wilson, I mean, like even became a figure. This has been something that people have been playing with ever since 3D printing uh, came to be. Uh, Cody Wilson, of course, popularized it and spread it around. The reason this has come in right now was because uh, the State Department had forced uh, Cody Wilson's company, Defense Distributed, to pull these files that they were distributing for free off of their website. And this was obviously a First Amendment issue because it's a prior restraint on, on putting up these designs, which is all these are. You have to can think of them that like think of them legally. They're the same as if I drew a gun on paper and showed it to you. That's or presu- a, or yeah. a blueprint that right, like exactly. showed you how to put it together. Yeah, yeah. And that's still my expression because you know, the design of a gun could be exactly as artistic as it is technical. Uh, so there was a long drawn out le- uh, legal battle, and then finally, the State Department said, "Why, why are we?" 
Why are we doing this? Let's just, they knew their case wasn't that strong. What was their claim? Their claim was that this, uh, State Department's claim? Yes. They claimed that putting the weapons up, and this is, this is fantastic, putting the weapons up for free and unlimited download online constituted exporting defense articles under the Cold War era uh, international yeah. tr uh, treaty arms yeah. regulation. This, yeah. this is the same as the arguments that were made about encryption. Right. Too, that, yeah. Oh, they used ITAR, the ITAR against encryption? So you mean I like don't know if they used that specific, it? but they, the, the arguments against encryption the was that you, if you put it out there, you were basically exporting, um, I don't know if it, they categorized as munitions, right. but some sort of weapon because it could hide. And Yeah, these ITAR regulations, I mean, in many ways, they're just to keep you from putting plans for like an Apache helicopter <laughs> online that the North Koreans could download or something like that. But And that's sort of what they claimed about these 3D printed guns. Well, ITAR is really about like shipping bulletproof vests to Central Africa. That's what it's really about. It, it, these developments have all been an out, outgrowth of just increasingly uh, aggressive readings of a really poorly written statute. Uh, and even if you look at the statute, it specifically exempts all information that's in the public domain. And so by definition, when you put your file up and say anyone can download this for free, it's part of the public domain. So it was just a bad case. And um, so the government decided they were going to settle. They were going to just give him his legal fees and, and leave him alone. There was some very strange technicalities with how they did that, but that's you know a, a different topic. Uh, and then what was reported was that 3D downloadable guns were becoming legal on the effective date of the settlement. Not that they had ever been illegal before, but that it's now the government is going to stop messing with people who put them online. And so this caused a media frenzy of people who, you know, could, it's, it's, it's been interesting because you've had mass confusion of the First and Second Amendment. No one is really sure which one we're talking about, but that's what's drove it into the spotlight. Yeah, now, these plans, uh, you put them into a 3D printer um, and like a really expensive 3D printer. Do you have to go drop five grand on some <laughs> something? Because you, you have, yeah. I, I guess full disorder, you have printed a gun, correct? Yes. Uh, which we can talk about exactly what that means. But you right. said, so what is the process of that? Okay, so it's not like a PDF file where you just hit print and it goes. These are actually... Uh, there, it's a series of points. It is literally a digital blueprint. It is just a 3D model. Uh, you feed that to, so if you want me to explain the process of how please, this works. Please. Yeah. You take this 3D model, which would be like the same thing that was used in a video game. In fact, I've actually, I've actually literally ripped files from a video game that had a stupid French gun that I really liked and printed a little scale model of it, a little scale one that's sitting at my desk. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's just a 3D file. You then take it and feed it to what's called a slicer. The slicer analyzes the file and determines what is the best way that this could be printed. How a 3D printer works is it just heats up a type of plastic to its melting point and then lays it down in rows. Imagine, imagine if you put a hot glue gun on a little motor that carried it in very specific locations. That's how this works. So the slicer does that you then feed this G-code file to the printer, and this is the G-code file is what tells the printer, okay, get this hot, move left, move right, move right, for 30 hours, and then eventually you've got your piece. And how much is the printer? Okay, right. So the printers can range from, uh, like the one I use, which I always like to tell people, I mean, I've heavily modified it from what it was originally, but the original price on it was $150. And I kind of did that intentionally. I bought the cheapest printer and saw what I could push out of it. But you can buy very competent printers for $250, $300. Most firearms have historically not been made out of plastic right. for probably very good reasons. So why are these a thing? I mean, is it is it pretty ill-advised to hold in your hand a 3D plastic gun that you've made and shoot it off? I mean... With the equipment I have available to me, uh, I would never do that. When the whole gun is 3D printed, no. You ha so here's the thing. People always say, oh, the technology is going to get better. You know, this That's why I'm not making an argument out of the fact that it's hard and kind of technical to do because I don't think that's relevant. Because um, one, this is absolutely a First Amendment issue. And even if you made it illegal to 3D print a gun, you would not be able to illegalize the design for the gun. 
Or uh, the communicating how to do it. Because exactly. I, I can tell people how to saw off a shotgun. Exactly. But I cannot saw legally saw off a shotgun. Right. Yeah. Um, but so even as technology gets better with 3D printing, it's going to have to be made of plastic, at, at least beyond any advancement in technology that is not on the horizon. Uh, the metals, there are metal printers, but they require the use of a furnace, which is the furnace is the real expensive part there to actually center the metal. Uh, people, people don't really understand that. Uh, the plastic, if you're going to make the barrel or the bolt, which is the parts that hold pressure, they depend on the spring capabilities of steel to be able to withstand the, you know, the explosive forces, all of that pressure, and then contract back to their original shape and do it again. What, what that happens with plastic, the plastic fatigues. It deforms. And every single shot, it's just going to get a little bit, a little bit, a little bit weaker until ultimately you're going to have a failure, which could be harmful. Yes, because this, we're talking about a lethal amount of, fo again, it's basic physics. If it's got enough energy to throw uh, you know, several grams of lead downrange very, very fast, it's got enough energy to do some bad things if it's localized. Uh, so you just, it's just, I don't advise it. I, I've printed, I actually never did a completely 3D printed gun until all of this hysteria came up and I was like, well, you know what? I'm just going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> but there are also gun parts. Right. So there are tons of parts on a gun. Some of them don't hold up to any pressure at all. Some of them hold up to minor stress that actually you can buy uh, very guns that are very much plastic. Uh, and all of this, uh, by the way, the laws about undetectable guns came around in the 1980s when uh, everyone was horrified that Glock was going to make a completely plastic Glock. And of course, Glock would, would say, no, 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 we're not going to do that. That's kind of stupid. So they imagine- It's going to be a really bad gun yeah. that, that will melt after a yeah. few uses. Yes. So they imagine these ceramics and all these things. None of this ever came to materialize because steel is really good at its job. This is something that steel is for. Uh, but I mean, yeah. if I learned anything from that movie in the line of fire, <laughs> you only need to get off one shot. <laughs> To kill, to kill a president yeah. or, or right. a guy probably, did I just commit that federal offense about, no, I didn't say I was going to. Yeah. No, to, to, to bring it on a plane or right. bring it through yeah. you know, metal detector, that, that seems to be a real big, I mean, that's what everyone, I think it was Chuck Schumer or someone said, coming soon to right. an yeah, airport near you, near, to a yeah. school near you. Even if we have metal detectors, we can, right. you can just walk right in with that. Uh, that's true. Well, so there's a, there's a couple things there, but I want to finish on the- uh, Okay, the, please, the, yes. Because we were about to get to the receiver thing. So- a part that doesn't take much stress is the receiver on many guns. And the way a receiver is defined is totally up to the whims of the ATF. So I, I couldn't give you any principled um, reasons behind it. On, on some guns, it's literally a tube. On some guns, it's a side plate. It, it's very strange how it's defined. But with an AR-15, the receiver is the lower part that holds the trigger mechanism. Uh, which makes it kind of makes sense because you know that's what would separate a machine gun from not a machine gun, what have you. Well, so you can print out one of these things because it doesn't hold up to any of the stresses of firing, and you can do a pretty good job. I've printed up one with my you know home cobbled 3D printer that's held up to hundreds of rounds, uh, and people will say, "Well, well, but then you know that's the only part that's a firearm, so now anyone can just get it." Well, yes, and nothing is changed because of 3D printing. This has always been on the, in the cards. People have been able to, uh, th if you go on YouTube, there's AR lowers that were carved from wood, uh, that were milled from aluminum, that were milled from plastic. This has just always been something that has existed. Um, I wouldn't even argue that 3D printing makes it much easier. I would actually say that it's easier to carve out a 80% aluminum lower receiver and just have that be your gun, and there's no background checks there. So it's not that this isn't a cause for concern, although I don't think it is enough to justify a serious legislative response. It's that the 3D printing doesn't make a difference. It doesn't change anything. But why is, isn't it crazy that like people are building guns in their house? That that. I mean, it's not something I plan on doing anytime soon. Um, well, that's I, until I come over next week. Of course, yeah. <laughs> I mean, maybe we'll build one together. But, but it, it, that seems. It, I, I think if you went to most Western right. countries and said, "It's just legal to make a gun in your house," well, I'd they, like that to, would be crazy. That would seem yeah. crazy to Germans and Brits and well, now it would. everyone. But like, I mean, you can do this in a variety of ways. Yeah. It's been true for a very long time, correct? Well, yeah. Right now, it would seem crazy because of the way our culture has 
uh, adapted around this. And I would actually like to go on a small tangent about the Brits and their gun design. It used to be that they had uh, talented gunsmiths that would design and make their guns at home. And so for the longest time, they had some of the best weapons in the world because they had a very good shooting culture, a very uh, advanced shooting culture that would, was often developing new designs and fabricating things at home. And these would develop into all kinds of different weapons. Then after that stopped being an issue. Uh, because they, the culture died or, right. or it was made illegal. It was made illegal um, under the, the guise of wildlife protection. The uh, Royal Small, Small Arms Factory Enfield, where these designs happen, they only hire the best uh, you know, Cambridge engineers. And so now they got all these engineers that had no experience with gun design and actually a lot of them had never held a gun. And so they went on, they went from producing some of the best small arms in the world to producing a firearm that literally didn't work. And that is the standard, that was the standard equipment of their armed forces, a gun that did not function in the, in the most basic way. And that's something that we don't have here in the US. Here for years, we've valued people who design anything. We, our culture values entrepreneurs and people who take initiative and design things. That's just something that we have here. And in the gun context, I mean, certainly, I don't think nowadays we'd have a David Williams who was a convicted murderer who designed a semi-automatic weapon in prison and was then turned into a national icon when it was adopted by the military. I don't think that- anyway, we, He was like, he was in the prison metal shop or something and decided yeah. to build a gun. Well, he was in the pr prison, he was in the prison. He would show them, he would show the guards his designs. They said, oh, you're really good. We're going to let you use the lathe. And then he designed four different semi-automatic rifles in jail, had his sentence commuted because of it, went and worked for, um, worked in the government and designed the M1 carbine, one of the most prolific weapons of the US armed forces and was turned, there was a movie made about him. He became a national icon. I'm saying our culture has shifted from then, but we still, I think we still value designers in general here enough that that it should it should never be said that oh well you know if if you if you have a, a kid that says i'd like to design a new gun you shouldn't tell them don't don't do that you'll go to jail you know that's what we're dealing with here are there any worries then about 3d printed guns i mean what, what you've told us so far is so these it's a first amendment issue right. you can't you know so the the government is constitutionally barred from stopping the dissemination of these plans. And then also, of course, there's the, if we know anything about the internet, like you can't, even if they, it would be impossible to stop it even right. if you wanted to. And even if you made it illegal, people would still do it. And you can pass these around and encrypt it. I mean, it's just- Shut down the tube. Someone's got to clean up these CAD <laughs> files and then right. we'll open them back up. Yes. So, <laughs> uh, but that that even bracketing that, there's there's not a lot of use for these things. They are largely, it sounds like they are novelty items at the moment, mm -hmm. to make them anything more than novelty items would involve a huge expense. So, like being able to print with metal and right. whatnot. Um, so, is this just is this just an issue that we should just like? No matter which side we're on on the gun control debate, we should just entirely drop. Or are there any legitimate concerns here or on the horizon within this general area? Well, I'd resist that. It it's only for useful for novelty i think it's i think it's most useful for prototyping and development of new designs and that's what this suppression is really hampered down on the most it's people who have new ideas that want to share them because it's not illegal to have the files it actually is not illegal for me to email them to you even right now uh, as long as you're a u.s citizen of course uh, but as for this being a legitimate concern like a safety concern i'd say not in the u.s um, these, these weapons that are completely 3D printed, that creates a concern in other countries where you don't have, so in the US is pretty unique in that you can buy a barrel, a bolt, all the other gun parts right over the counter. And that's something that it would be very hard to change, I think. Most of these parts are unregulated and it would be almost impossible to put a damper on the existing supply of barrels, bolts, all these important parts that need to be made from metal. In other countries, though, where every part of a gun is restricted, these single-shot, fully 3D-printed guns are more of a legitimate concern. However, they're not more of a concern than any other homemade gun. If you go on Amazon and there is a book about how to make a 9mm submachine gun from hardware store parts, 
uh, that is actually quite effective. I haven't used one. I've seen videos of of this type of gun, and they actually find these in Australia. There was a there was a guy who worked out of a storage unit and produced a bunch of them from like like tubing and tubing. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, I was shot by the video of of uh, which I put on a blog post a couple yeah. a week of, of just a shotgun which are literally just two yeah. store bought pieces of tube yeah. that perfectly fits a 12 gauge thing and you just put, and then you have another tube and you ram them together yep. and you have a shotgun for yeah. like $7. Yeah, that's and that's always a, been legal, probably yeah. stupid. Yeah, that's called a zip gun. And uh zip guns have existed as long as ammunition exists because guns at their core are very simple. So I'd say that is the biggest argument against these things in other countries in other in other countries I'd say that's the biggest cause of concern but then I would immediately say but it makes no difference because pipe well, yeah well I mean it, I mean it's a concern if you care about Japan's restricted gun laws which I think are a bad idea anyway yeah. although crime is gonna be low in Japan no matter what you do right. uh, but if you're trying to keep that out, then yeah, people can 3D print guns, but also there there might be some sort of underground hobbyist culture for building guns in Japan anyway. Probably. But here's the better question. What about criminals? I mean, like actual criminals who are prohibited from purchasing a gun right. under background checks uh, who c can't go to a gun store. Because mm -hmm. I've, I've raised the point that you can pay $150 and get a pretty cheap yeah. nine millimeter pistol from a company called High Point that you showed me. but. You have to go to a federal firearms license generally, and you can't have it if you're a felon legally. So what if you're out there looking for a gun to commit some crime or to protect yourself, and then you say, hey, let's hey, hey, let's get a 3D printer and use that. I mean, that seems like a real concern. Right. So it's also illegal in most states to just go out and buy weed, but I don't think it would take you too terribly long to, to find a source. Uh, so guns are kind of the same way. It is, it's pretty cheap to be able to get a gun, quote unquote, off the street. And that's what most criminals are going to do. They'll either get a straw purchaser, which is, you know, have somebody else who is legally allowed go and buy it uh, and just use it that way, file off the serial numbers, what have you. It's just, we're just, we just don't live in a society where the cost structure, where, where it would make sense from, from the uh, criminal's perspective to invest in and learn this new technology and then also sit and wait. Uh, most common criminals, I don't think, would have the patience to like wait 40 hours for a single shot uh, pistol to to come off their printer and then file it and you know assemble it correctly. I mean, as Homer Simpson said, I'm angry now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, the gun episode, yeah. yeah. But, uh, but I mean, on the long run, though, uh, everyone's in the gun 3D gun printing community, which you are somewhat a part of. Right. Um, the, the ultimate goal is to make these better, correct? I mean, yeah. I mean that's what they're trying to do. They, the first one, proof of concept, often called the Liberator, uh, one shot, yeah, not rifled, effective range of about twenty feet. I mean, yeah. it, it's a, it was a real, a week. it was a real not very good gun, but it, it showed that you could do it without any piece of metal in right. it. Um, now you have things like the Songbird, which right. which looks more like a regular pistol. And if you let people just continue to work on these plans, you're just going to be people churning out more and more effective guns. Right. And eventually, you might just get one that I don't. I mean, I, you said it's not going to be possible, but like you know, maybe ten shots before it melts in your hand. But that's enough to do a, a shooting rampage if you're a felon and you can't get a gun any other way. Right. Well, I know I, I wouldn't say it's not possible. And there's actually plans for which are easy. You, it's very easy to get these plans. Uh, for a revolver that just uses uh, a insert, just uses metal inserts in the chambers, and they've been able to get quite a few shots out of that. Uh, I mean, then that if you're going to have a repeatable firearm, it's going to have to have a metal barrel and chamber, which gets over these, you know, uh, airport security concerns. And also, the big thing about a fully plastic one is that it has to be pretty huge to hold any uh, cartridge that is you know, really lethal. So it's it's hard to sneak through a metal detector with a, you know, five inch bulge regardless. Uh, so but, so still not not yeah. really gonna happen. So you're yeah. saying and we're still a ways away from being able to three D print bullets then. <laughs> Actually, so the bullet is a technical term. It, it's just the projectile. Uh, we do three D print bullets. 
but they're, it's a funny thing that we do. It's, it, we use them for target practice because they are stupidly light. They're far too light to actually use with gunpowder. So you basically just you print out a bullet and just put a primer in, and you can use that as practice ammo at the range if you're exceedingly cheap like I am. So. Well, well I, I'm like my blown away right now. Like you said, it's like a little plastic bullet, and you just have a percussion cap. Yeah, just a primer. And so it goes very slow? No, it comes out at like 800 feet a second. Oh, really? It's just so light. It's just so light. Uh, whereas a, Could you kill someone with one? No, I think it would hurt very badly. Uh, but So there's other plastic ammo. Plastic ammo has existed for a while. The Germans use it to as training munitions. Uh, it's still very weak, but the the one they have that... Has to, it still has to be fired out of a steel gun, but they have one that uses a full charge of gunpowder under this extremely light projectile. The projectile weighs like 10 grains. For comparison, the typical projectile in a rifle in the 308 is 150 grains. So this is stupidly light, but it comes out at 4,000 feet a second. So, you know, the, the energy is a function of those two factors. It's, it's lethal. Uh, the ones that you 3D print, it would just be... If you actually put gunpowder behind it, they would melt in your gun and ruin it. So you just put the primer in, and it comes out at a somewhat competent velocity, enough to poke a hole in paper, but it would it would be a bit foolish to try to use that in a defensive situation, I'd say. So if we understand that there are a lot of gun hobbyists out there who enjoy tinkering on them, just like enjoying tinkering, or tinkering on cars, and there's AR-15s that are not terribly particularly dangerous or high capacity magazines, which again are not particularly dangerous. Silencers don't really make guns like dark guns. 3D printed guns aren't that dangerous uh, and they're not dangerous into the future. Um, is there anything in, in the world of guns uh, you know, that you think we should be concerned about? Should people, it, you seem pretty blase to so say, oh, okay, well, let's let's just make grenades legal or rocket launchers or anything like that. Uh, you know, is, right. are those the kind of things that just say, you know, homemade rocket launchers? Why not? <laughs> uh, you know, sh should we or should we draw a line somewhere? So there's not what I've the main takeaway from discussing all these different types of weapons is that there's really, it's really only marginal. There aren't particular firearms that are super deadly. They're they're all deadly, right? So. There's not really much principle to be drawn there. Uh, what I would say is that any type of restrictions on firearms that are that firearms or weapons generally that are uh, legitimate would be ones that were based in a theory of public nuisance, to where which would mean that this pretty much cannot be used competently to defend yourself, as in like. I would say a tactical nuclear bomb uh, probably has no legitimate defensive use. Uh, whereas probably would, grenades too. Probably the, uh, the, the, because they're, it easily has traffic. Yeah, hand with. grenades are just yeah are 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 quite difficult to use carefully. Um, but I would say, I I am generally of the opinion that there is no shoulder fired weapon that is is very legitimately regulated or made criminal because like i said all of the differences even when we're talking about machine guns regardless of caliber it's all limited by recoil and the effect efficacy is really quite limited when it comes to individuals so there's just not really much point in drawing that line and if you're going to draw it it has to be it has to take into account that when you criminalize these things you're going to be going through neighborhoods and enforcing these laws, you're going to be putting people in jail. That's something that people don't ever think about. When you make a high capacity magazine ban and there's millions and millions of these out there, what about all of the families that are going to lose breadwinners as a result of that? That needs to be seriously taken into account. And so I would say that restrictions on tactical nukes can probably be said too. Thanks for listening. Free Thoughts is produced by Test Terrible. If you enjoyed today's show, please rate and review us on iTunes. And if you'd like to learn more about libertarianism, find us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.